Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to all of my subscribers and to all of you who are joining me tonight. I do hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm doing very well, thank you very much. And I'm so delighted to be with you this evening. But before we get started, don't forget to get that quintessential perfect drink because I know some of you drink rather unusual, very exciting stuff. And you know the rules. If I don't know what you're drinking, I need to know about it. <laughs> but before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, I've been a taxi driver here in Toronto for over 20 years, and that's a long time indeed. And in my years as a taxi driver, I've met a kaleidoscope of very vibrant, colourful people with all kinds of different personality types, cultures and interesting backgrounds, from the very self-effacing, timorous and reticent, to the more effusive, gregarious and effervescent types, to the downright rude and offensive. I've braved all manner of treacherous weather conditions, from gale-force winds to sleet, snow, rain, hail and thunder, and I've seen things on my journeys, sometimes at the dead of night, that have left me wondering, what the heck was that? The trouble is that I've found my anomalous experiences have been so fleeting that I've shrugged my shoulders in a nonchalant way and put down the experience as a possible moment of madness, when I'm certain my fatigue from the long journey has caused me to see disjointed things that aren't actually there. But now, I'm not so sure. I had one occasion when I vividly recall picking up a young girl on the sidewalk, who was soaked to the skin and completely drenched on a very rainy night, when no one in their right mind should be walking on their own, especially a young woman, and given she was a similar age to one of my daughters, I felt naturally very protective towards the poor little mite. I was returning to Toronto from Alberta at the time, so it didn't cost me anything to give the young girl a lift. Indeed, it would have been very unchivalrous of me not to have helped a woman caught up in the rain. I remember her getting into the back seat of my car and barely saying a single word, which I thought was strange, because a thank you would have been very nice. I guess she was just relieved to be out of the pouring rain that was now belting down. I do vaguely remember she was wearing a long white dress that was clinging to her body like a wet rag, and her mousy brown hair was wet and limp around her face, while her hazel eyes looked unusually frightened. I could hear her sniffing at the back of the taxi and blowing her nose very hard, almost as if she'd been crying for some time, but I thought it would be rather intrusive and invasive to ask her why she was so upset. So I ignored all the crying. After all, it wasn't really my business. Where do you want me to drop you off? I'd asked her. I'm going as far as Toronto. And she told me that was great, which I did think was odd, as Toronto was hours away on the journey. When I reached the next stop sign, I turned around to offer my passenger some snacks. But she had gone, vanished into thin air and I discovered that the seat was as dry as a bone. I assure you no one could have got out of my taxi with rain like that, looking the way she did, without leaving wet marks all over the seat. I was completely baffled, and the hair on the back of my neck stood on edge, and I remember thinking, what the heck? All these years later, I still refuse to believe that I saw a ghost, but I'm left wondering how she managed to escape from a locked taxi and why the seats were bone dry when the girl I picked up was drenched to the skin. None of it makes any sense at all. I am one of those rare taxi drivers here in Toronto that are few and far between, as I don't mind the long drawn out car journeys that all the other drivers are reluctant to do, as they're eager to return home to their loving families. In my case, going home is invariably a bit like playing Russian roulette, as my beloved wife Nancy suffers from debilitating bouts of manic depression that have been devastating to her quality of life, and despite help from multiple specialists, the problem has only got progressively worse over the years and is something we've had to learn to live with. Don't get me wrong, I love my wife to pieces, I rarely do, 
but when she's having a depressive episode, I'd rather be anywhere else in the entire world than at home, as the energy becomes so heavy and oppressive for me. When my wife is in a good mood, our house is light, airy and vibrant, and that's when I enjoy being around her, because she's a great deal of fun to be with. In truth, it's a little like being married to two different women, and it is the amusing, carefree, fun-loving wife that I love spending time with. But the obnoxious, vindictive, depressed woman I would sooner avoid at every cost. I think my children simply couldn't wait to leave our home as soon as they were old enough, as living with a manic depressive is far from easy. On this occasion, my wife was having one of her debilitating, dark, gloomy episodes, when the weight of the world had sucked out her joy like a hungry parasite, and her dreadful mood was like a dark, oppressive thundercloud, longing to unleash its furious wrath on our cosy little home that now morphed into a place of chaos and discord, a place where I didn't want to hang around. So I was willing to offer my services to an old lady called May, who was desirous to return to her childhood home in Alberta to visit her sister Agnes and take the arduous 36-hour drive to her old abode. Hello there, said the old lady, climbing into the back of my car with a large peach and gold handbag and a comfortable-looking soft cream blanket for the journey. I noticed that she was a neat, willowy-looking lady, without a single white hair out of place, with a flawless peachy complexion that was not very lined except for around her bright, piercing blue eyes. I discerned that she was elegantly attired in a smart pink cashmere cardigan with white buttons and a very stylish pair of white cotton trousers that flared at the bottom in a large square, which was exceedingly flattering. I noticed she walked with an elegance and straight, graceful pose that certainly made me wonder if she'd once been a ballet dancer or model, but I chose not to ask. I really appreciate you taking me on this long, drawn-out journey. I'm afraid I'm not very good on trains, and I am rather frightened of flying. But driving? No, I'm not adverse to that at all. I love the scenic vistas and beguiling landscape of the Canadian wilderness that you can observe through your window, and of course all the charming small towns you encounter. Now you'd certainly miss out if you were on a plane, wouldn't you? You know, ma'am, you are absolutely right. I've been a taxi driver for twenty years, and never do I get tired of the bedazzling scenery. I love driving through the Canadian wilderness. The scenery is quite magnificent and spectacular. And I do get to see indigenous wildlife, so I can't complain. Over the years I've seen hundreds of wild ducks crossing the road all at once. And that was a sight to behold. Never seen anything like it again. Another time I saw a cougar and all her family of kittens, about eight of them they were, crossing the road together. And that blew my mind. And those kittens, they were the cutest things I've ever seen. I bet it was incredible, laughed the old lady. It's called being in the right place at the right time. You do know that. Oh, may I ask you to please forget all the formalities? Just call me May. I can't abide standing on ceremony. It's just so pretentious. It's not my kind of thing. As we drove out of Toronto, I glanced at May briefly through the rear window and smiled to myself. I was certainly going to enjoy this trip. I could feel I connected with this little old dear. And over the years, some of my older passengers had enlightened me with their depth, insight, wisdom and humour that had made my life so much richer as a taxi driver. And on the whole, I did like most people, but I could see that May was very special. There was a gentle elegance to her that rather reminded me of a giraffe. Although she wasn't tall, but it was just her deportment and grace that beguiled and intrigued me. Are you comfortable, May? I asked her. I couldn't help noticing that you were twitching ever so slightly. You're not cold, are you? Would you like me to turn up the heater for you? Oh, goodness, no. I'm warm enough. Don't mind me, dear, she said. I'm just a little nervous. I've not been back home for forty long years or so. I haven't seen or spoken to my sister Agnes since then, so I am a little anxious about the kind of reception 
I might ultimately received. The name's William, I said. Just call me Will. You haven't been home for forty years? That's crazy. That's a long time to be away from home. Yes, it is, isn't it? And no one regrets it much more than I do. But pride and ego have held me back for doing what I should have done a long time ago. Do you know my sister Agnes and I have not spoken to each other in forty years? Can you believe that? Not even on the telephone, which is insanely ridiculous. In truth, she doesn't even know I'm visiting her off the cuff like this. It's a random, spontaneous visit that could either go dreadfully wrong or I hope be a move in the right direction. You mean your sister does not know you're visiting her in Alberta? I asked, looking aghast. No, she has no idea I'm visiting her. But I need to see her face to face and apologise and to make my peace with her. You know, the funny thing is, I've been trying to rack my brains to remember what actually caused the family fallout and rift in the first place, which makes the whole thing even more ludicrous. I've tried to remember what instigated the catastrophic balmy between us that changed my life forever. I really can't even remember what it was, but once we decided we would never speak to each other, the long drawn out battle between us began and we both decided we hated and despised each other, and I don't exactly know why. It seems ridiculous and nonsensical now. It sounds dreadful, I said. But I, if it makes you feel any better, you're not the first. There are lots of people out there, many I've met myself, who haven't spoken to their family for many years. Of course it is awful when siblings fall out with each other. I do take it that you were quite close once. Oh, very. That's what makes this whole business so dreadfully preposterous. Growing up, Agnes and I were inseparable and enjoyed doing absolutely everything together, surrounded by the exquisite lush Alberta countryside. It was an idyllic lifestyle. We rode horses, bicycles, explored the wood green together. And those were the days of my life, and truly they were amazing. Believe it or not, I've rarely missed Agnes, but I have been in denial about it for so long. I haven't had the courage to pick up the phone. So, if I may ask, why this sudden change of heart? I asked curiously. What made you decide to redeem the situation and to reach out to your sister like this? I do admire your bravery and courage. I can't imagine it's easy. Well, it's simple. I'm dying. It's amazing how dying begins to put everything in perspective for you. The doctors diagnosed me with six months to live. You know, the dreaded big C word. Let's not say it, shall we? That's what I've got. But I've refused all the chemo because I don't want to face any drawn out sickness. I just couldn't face that. Oh, I am sorry to hear that. That is bad news indeed. Oh, please don't feel sorry for me, Will. I couldn't stand that. I've lived a rich and full life, really I have. But there is one thing I truly regret, and it's not mending the bridge between my sister a long time ago. But I'm determined to fix everything before I finally exit the earth plane. I certainly don't want my sister to have ill feelings towards me once I'm gone. Are you scared to die? I asked. If you don't mind me asking you such a personal question, and I know it's impertinent, it's just, well, I am terrified to die myself. It's something that scares the living hell out of me. I worry about it all the time. I'm not going to kid. It's a terrible fear of mine. I've seen some frightful accidents on those roads from time to time, and some of them fatal. And it's very discomposing, I assure you. Oh, finally, a man after my own heart, piped May. I knew I should take this taxi ride with you. It's so wonderful to meet someone who's not afraid to talk about death and dying. It's a dreaded word among so many of my friends, and people tend to brush it off under the carpet and they're afraid to talk about it. But I find discussing death helps me to come to terms with my next journey. 
Do you believe in heaven? I asked her. Well, I've been a good Christian all my life, but there are times I do find myself wondering if this is all there is, and that scares me half to death, I'm not going to lie. I often visit that place of doubt that the Bible teaches us to avoid like the plague, but I can't help it. Yes, I would like to believe that heaven is real, but I do struggle with that sometimes. Well, I'm sure it's real, I said. Otherwise, what is the point of just living and dying? It would seem senseless to me. If I can give you a word of sound advice, I'd like you not to resist the chocolate cake and some of the naughty food we're told never to eat, said May, chuckling. What are you talking about? I asked. You're intriguing me with that question. Well, I have friends older than me that have smoked like chimneys every single day of their lives. It makes me sick. And they've eaten the most atrocious food, but they're still fighting fit. And now look at me. I, on the other hand, was a saint. I exercised every day of my life, watched my diet like a hawk, resisted sweet temptations, declined alcohol, and I'm the only one in my peer group with cancer. Can you believe the fairness of it all? I mean, I did everything absolutely right, and I had an iron cast willpower. And where did it get me? I would be at an Italian restaurant, drooling over my friend's pizza that she'd ordered, and I told myself firmly that I would be good and order the salad instead. And I regret that big time. If I could turn the clock right back, I would not have said no to that melt-in-the-mouth cheese pizza or chocolate cake. And, of course, the occasional drink would have been really rather nice, but I avoided it like the plague. And looking back, it seems so silly. A lot of things seem so silly in retrospect. I think that's excellent advice, May, if I may say so. Let's not, kid. As a taxi driver, exercising is exceedingly difficult. We also have an atrocious reputation when it comes to our diets. It means we often eat on the run and don't always opt for the best healthy food, I'm afraid. But I do agree, we do only live once. So the occasional treat, well, that's got to be a good thing. After several hours of driving, May insisted that we stayed overnight at a very palatial, regal and opulent-looking hotel with large white Italianite architecture and ornate columns and hundreds of sparkling chandeliers everywhere with bedroom suites that were so grandiose and well-appointed that even the Sultan of Brunei would have been terribly impressed. May covered all the extravagant expenses as at her age she wanted to spread out the journey and stop for the occasional bite to eat or to enjoy a little brisk walk in the glorious rose gardens at the hotel and spend time at the koi pond and waterfall reaching in the water to stroke the sleek orange bodies of the fish. I noticed that she was ordering pizza and chocolate cake in the illustrious dining room swathed in resplendent red and gold decor where an a la carte menu was on offer and some of the finest food that you've ever seen. I think May offended the waiter by insisting on ordering simple food that she had resisted for so long, and she knocked back several glasses of champagne and became quite tiddly. It was probably the first time in ages that she had let her hair down. I'm celebrating life, she told me happily. I'm making up for all that lost time and all that pizza that I never ordered. When you're dying, she told me, you want to enjoy every single minute that you have got left. When you're travelling, you want the quality of the meal to matter as much as the hotel. That's why I've chosen this place. It certainly was spectacular. The next day we arrived in Alberta. It was about 8.30 at night. And I did ask May if she fancied staying overnight at a local hotel and visiting her sister the following morning because she might feel slightly uncomfortable arriving on the front doorstep at this late hour of the night, even though it wasn't that late. Can I think about it, said May. I'd like you to drive down some of those back roads, if you don't mind, that I haven't seen for so many years. I want to see if I recognise anything, and if everything has changed. I followed May's directions, and was surprised that after so long away from home, she seemed to know her bearings exceedingly well. I could see she was crying. It looks like I remembered. Not much has changed, and it's been so long. 
It's as if I was riding down these country lanes with my sister Agnes only yesterday. It's a weird feeling, but it gives me lovely chills down my spine. The good kind, of course. Please will you drive towards that wooded area over there, she cried excitedly. Beyond the mountainous ridge on the right-hand side. Yes, that's right. I pulled up my taxi on the side of a dirt road, where there were open flowery prairies on either side. But in the distance I could see the quaking aspen trees rustling in the still breeze that framed the edge of a mountainous elevation that stretched out into an extensive wood green that almost completely covered the bottom half of the mountain in its sumptuous thick green foliage. I'm going to have to ask you to stop over here, said May. I want to get out for a moment. I need to see if a friend of mine is still around. Please don't think me weird, but I've been wanting to do this for a very long time. I've even dreamed of this and meditated on this very moment. You can do anything you like, May, I laughed. You're the one calling all the shots on this trip. I'm just your driver. I do what you say. Well, Will, I would like to think that you're a little more than that. Well, maybe I'm very presumptuous, but I'd like to be able to call you my friend. I smiled as I watched the graceful white-haired woman climbing out of the taxi, and I decided I really liked her. But what on earth was she doing? I could see her walking to the edge of the field, and then she cupped her fingers around her lips and began to call loudly. Mastro! Mastro! I shook my head. Maybe May was a little nutty after all, I thought secretly to myself, because I couldn't understand who on earth she was calling. Again and again she called out desperately the name of Mastro, but nothing and no one responded to her calls, and her despondent, disillusioned face registered a deep disappointment. Mastro! Mastro! May climbed back into the car. She looked so downcast and sad. I felt very sorry for her. I suppose it was too much to hope for that my friend would still be around, she said. It's called wishful thinking, I suppose. I imagine he's moved away by now. How silly of me to think he might still be in the local vicinity. I started up the engine, and then all of a sudden this monstrously huge creature was standing in front of the car, waving us down with his large arms. And I remember thinking, what in God's name is that? Maestra! Maestra! It's Maestra! piped May, the tears pouring down her face. Oh my God, it's Maestra! He's got so big! You have to stop now! Stop the car now! I stopped the car and May opened the car door, closing it behind her, running towards this colossal-sized creature that I realised to my astonishment was most certainly a Bigfoot. This Bigfoot creature certainly made May look like a tiny Barbie doll, because he was easily ten foot tall and three foot across the shoulder area, and easily between eight to nine hundred pounds. He looked incredibly human, almost like a giant that was completely covered in long flowing dark hair, with a very powerful muscular body and a human face that was devoid of hair and looked quite leathery. I would say the only thing about the Bigfoot that resembled the primate species was the overlong arms that literally hung below the knees, and of course the pyramid shape of the head with its pointed tip. I would say the Bigfoot was very intimidating and frightening to look at, but seeing May rush up to this creature, I felt this overwhelming sense of euphoria, because I could feel the electricity between the two of them. I could hear May crying, Mastro, it's really you! Oh my God, it's really you! I thought I'd never see you again, she said gently touching the creature's face and stroking his cheek. The critter's brown eyes danced with joy. His face looked animated to see May again, and the love and affection he had for her was so clearly seen in his big, beautiful brown eyes. When he reached for May, he threw her up in the air very gently and tenderly, and May lifted up her leg and pointed it, and squealed with laughter. I'm willing to bet she'd done ballet with this Bigfoot before, because they did some different manoeuvres together, as if they were practising them all over again, with a Bigfoot holding May up for support like a male ballet dancer would. It was so beautiful to watch these different moves, and I was completely transfixed. Finally, Maestro put May on the ground, and they just held each other so tightly 
but it was funny to watch because May could not get her body around his sizable barrel chest. I'm not one to cry easily, but the tears rolled down my cheeks because May had an incredible relationship with this Bigfoot, a relationship that some people would dream of to have with a human being. After a long while, May hugged the creature tenderly and climbed back into the car, the tears pouring down her cheeks, while the Bigfoot ran beside her for a long while, looking directly in at May with bright, happy eyes. It ran along with our car for quite some time, at a very fast speed, not getting remotely out of breath. I'd never seen anything run like that before. Go to an extravagant posh hotel right now, said May, with no expense spared and all the trimmings, along with a bottle of the finest French champagne for the both of us to enjoy. I have so much to celebrate on this fantastic evening, an evening I shall never forget. I'm too emotional to see my sister right now, Seeing Maestro again has made me the happiest woman in the entire world. I'm sorry to blubber like this in your taxi, but Maestro is so very special to me, and I never thought I would ever see him again. You do realise this Maestro friend of yours is known as a Bigfoot, I told her. Now, how do you know him? That's what I'm curious about. When I was about 40 years old and still living at the farm with my mother and sister. I never got married, you see. Well, I found Maestro in the woods one day. Oh, he was so adorable. The poor little thing, he was only about two foot tall at the time, and still a little youngling. He was crying out in agony, because his foot was caught in one of those ghastly illegal traps that someone had set up. I immediately ran up to him and managed to release his foot from the trap, and brought him back to my home. He was really badly hurt, so I gave him some medical treatments that really helped. My family liked him and called him the wild boy, but Maestro and I had that quintessential perfect friendship. Every time I went into the woods, Maestro would be there, and he would be waiting for me. We grew very close. We would do ballet together, because I'd been a ballerina all my life, and I would teach him some of the moves, and he was a great male dancer. He was so natural, graceful and agile, and a fast learner, and better than any of the male dancers I danced with. I was able to understand him, and he also can speak to me telepathically. It's as though the thoughts just come into my head that aren't even mine. I know they're from him. Of course, when I left home, I never thought I'd ever see him again. So today, today, has been so meaningful for me. It's, it's just been incredible. So when you last saw him, I imagine he was still very young. Is that right? Yes, that is right. The last time I saw him, he'd grown quite a lot. He was five foot tall. But look how magnificently big he's now. Oh, and so handsome. Did you see the size of him and his long hair? And he smelt lovely too. Just just like pine, just like the way I always remember he smelt. He was telling me he has two girls and a partner now. Can you believe it? He knew I was dying because he can see a growing blackness in my energy field. He knows you're dying? I asked, looking astonished. Well, it's my energy field, you see. And, of course, the smell of the cancer, said May. Maestro has an extraordinary sense of smell. Of course, he is very sad that I'm sick, but so happy to see me. But he doesn't think about death in quite the same way as we do. He said he would have known my energy field anywhere, no matter how old I'd become, even though it's been so long. He said he's always known that he would see me once again. As you can imagine, I was stunned to not only have encountered the mythical creature called Bigfoot that I didn't even believe existed, but to have met a woman who had a friendship with a Bigfoot and after all this time had reunited with him again. I was privy to seeing this unparalleled, celebratory and momentous reunion, one that I could never, ever forget. I could only hope that in the morning that May's interaction with her sister Agnes would go as well, as indeed her reunion with Maestro had gone. I had my reservations, as I have ferried people over the years that I have met that are as hard as nails, who would be very unlikely to forgive. 
My biggest confounding fear would be if Agnes reacted to her sister adversely. That worried me significantly, because May had cancer. She was vulnerable and possibly alone in the world, without any other relatives. I could only pray that things would go well in the morning for her. It was about ten o'clock when I found myself driving down a remote dirt road through an open wooden gate, past acres of undulating verdant countryside that was quite exquisite. Silvery ponds and fenced-in pastures where a couple of horses were grazing happily in the fields. They glanced up at us curiously as we drove past. I finally reached the picturesque farmhouse that looked so whimsical and charming, and it had more in common with a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale than in our reality. It looked like a perfect symmetrical doll's house, with whitewashed walls and large open windows, with pale blue shutters, along with a blue roof. I noticed that there were pale blue window boxes outside the windows that were filled with colourful blooms. "'Please come in with me, Will,' said May, looking at me pleadingly with her pale blue eyes. "'I don't want to go in there all alone. I'm really scared.' "'But I'm just your taxi driver,' I insisted. "'Don't be so ridiculous. You're my friend,' insisted May. "'And I could do with a friend right now. "'Look at me. I'm shaking like a leaf.' I don't believe I've been so terrified to see anyone in all my life as I am now. As we both got out of the car, a buxom woman who was much bigger in stature than May, with a round, cheerful face and bright blue eyes, came darting out of the house towards us. Can I help you? she asked us, looking at me and then at May. For a second she didn't recognise her own sister, and then she did, and she gasped. "'Is that you, May?' she asked, unable to disguise her shock to see her sister. May just stood there, tears pouring down her cheeks. "'Agnes!' she cried. "'Agnes! I'm so sorry! I'm, I'm sorry for everything! Everything! Really, I am!' Agnes's face grew pale, and her eyes misted over, and then she began to sob. And the two sisters embraced, holding each other in their arms for a long time both of them crying. Please come in, said Agnes, leading her sister into the kitchen. It's been so very long, far, far too long. I think I'd better get going now, I said. You need to spend some quality time together. Are you sure you don't want to come in, Will, said May. I'd really like it if you did. No, it's very kind of you to offer, but I think I'd better be going back, I said, smiling. Give me a call when you want me to pick you up. I'll take you all the way back to Toronto, even if it's only in several weeks' time. Well, I hope May will be staying longer with us for a long time, said Agnes. After all, we have so much catching up to do. I went over to hug both women, and as I got close to May's sister Agnes, I whispered to her, Look after your sister. She's got cancer. She needs you. The woman nodded at me, her face etched with a deep sadness. I think in that moment she began to realise that there was so much wasted time because of a silly little family rift. I did go to May's funeral, and I was to discover that Agnes had spent all her remaining days with her sister, and she said it was the most precious time of her life, and she told me that Maestro the Bigfoot had left her a beautiful stone on the doorstep after May had died in memory of her. I don't know how he knew she was gone, Agnes told me. Maestro and May had an incredible bond. He visited her a few times because she got very ill. It made her very happy to see him. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, that was a fantastic story. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Until next time, goodbye and good night.